UK, we're experiencing difficulties with storms and flooding already, both from rivers overflowing and storms, but also from the sea level. Gradually, that will get a lot worse. And what the uh, international experts are predicting is that we will see um, areas becoming uninhabitable, huge migrations, probably, probably civil wars. These are the extreme situations that, uh, that they're forecasting. So uh, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, would, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us what projects you're currently involved with? Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. I'm, uh, I've had a long career in energy policy. I work for the British government. I was the director at the International Energy Agency. I was the, uh, the energy councillor in Washington for the UK. I chaired one of the G eight groups on nuclear safety. And now I'm working at the Grantham Institute, Imperial College is an institute concerned mainly with climate, mainly with climate change. But most of my work there has been with the Chinese, working with the Chinese on their energy policy, how they engage with the uh, International Energy Agency. And I'm hoping, depending on whether my, my grant comes through, to have a, a, uh, another project with them on their attitude, their attitude to global energy governance, the International Energy Agency, but also their Belt and Road, their enormous Belt and Road investment and how, that is, uh, how that's managed, how it relates to uh, other international energy projects. And uh, what is um, what is China's um, China's vision of um, uh, energy and climate change at the moment? Are they working China towards is, yeah. China is well? You can look at China in two ways. China is the worst polluter, right? China has an enormous economy that has grown exponentially in recent years and is largely based on coal to such an extent that china now burns about half of all the coal in the world it mines it and it burns it and that is an enormous contribution to uh greenhouse gas emissions it's, 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 it's how to define it, it's the biggest single uh, but now they want to change if you look at Xi Jinping's speeches to the party conference and so on, he is committing China to, in his rather colourful phrase, be a torchbearer for uh, addressing climate change and environmental problems. And, and I think they want to be a leader internationally in climate change, but also they have terrible local pollution, from mainly from coal, also from vehicles. Uh, I don't know if you, do you ever visit... Uh, Either yeah. Beijing or Shanghai or whatever, but uh, um, uh, maybe after the pandemic we will. <laughs> <laughs> well, the air is terrible. Right, it's not quite as bad as it was, but you know, literally, you could not on a bad day you could not see across the road. You look out of the window yeah. and you're just looking into a sort of browny grey mist. Um, it's a huge problem for them, and so they connect that because it, it's all to do with coal, well, largely to do with coal and also petrol in cars. And so they, so China is a country that is trying to change, trying to have a more positive, uh, uh, but they're starting from a very bad position as far as emissions are concerned. Right. So, um, so just to start off uh, with, with, uh, so what have been so. We, we've we've had so we, we've discovered oil from from my research from around 18, 1850s was it when we discovered oil Ooh. mainstream eighteen eighties that was my that was what Wikipedia told that's me about, that's about right yeah <laughs> that's about right. so what, could you tell us what impacts 
fossil fuel, fuels, especially oil, oil and gas, has had on our uh, civilization and global economy as a whole? Well, our economy and our lifestyle are built on. Now, that is what has raised us from uh, what I would call medieval poverty. Mm. Um, historically, it started with the Industrial Revolution in the UK. Before that, the only energy people had was uh, their own muscles. They had horses, other cattle. And they did have, to some extent, windmills and water mills, but very, very primitive. And the discovery of uh, coal steam engines of various kinds, whether for trains or for pumping water or whatever, you know, basic, has basically transformed uh, somebody like, um, I think it was uh, Wolf, of writer for the Financial Times, says, compared to metal, metal in the Middle Ages, we have a living standard undreamed of by princes. We can travel, we have comfortable homes, we have, to varying degrees, we have warmth, uh, uh, we can, uh, we have amazing manufacturing. It's all driven by fossil fuels, initially coal, now oil and oil and gas. It's, you know, I mean, this is the challenge of climate change. It's absolutely integral into our lives and changing it is, uh, we all use, I think I've got this right, about five tons of oil equivalent every year, on average, in the UK. Amazing. And not people might say, well, I don't really, but, you know, if you have it together, I don't, you know, I don't know, it depends how much you travel, whether you, uh, you probably have a warm home, you may have or use a car, certainly if you fly. Uh, all these things, and then, of course, all the products that you buy, uh, they've been manufactured with masses of energy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's a big question, but our lifestyle is based on these energies. Yeah. And could you, everyone knows about climate change and sort of what the climate crisis is, but could you sort of give a bit more background to the, effect, the effects um, of the climate crisis, just to illustrate the, yes. the impacts that yes. the fuels are having. Well, of course, it's already happening. That's the thing that people, you know, the, I think it's well known, I won't go into detail, I think it's well known, what is happening is that greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide, but other gases, methane is important as well, are accumulating in the atmosphere, and the effect is that the rays of the Earth which come through and hit the Earth, are reflected, instead of going back into outer space, are reflected back in again. That's how greenhouses work. That's why greenhouses will make your tomatoes grow. And it's raising the temperature. It's already raised it by one degree. We probably have at least another, because this is rather controversial, but at least another degree is probably two or three degrees pretty much locked in by the by the investments we've already made the power stations the cars things around the world and this has many effects one effect will be to raise the sea level gradually happening already some island the most vulnerable island states are already feeling directly threatened threatened by that it will raise temperatures and in some areas it will sort of energize the atmosphere in a way that in some areas will actually cause extremes of floods, but in other areas will cause extremes of drought. So we're expecting more areas, and this also is rather to become as arid and unusable agriculturally. So this is going to exacerbate poverty in some of the poorest countries in the world. In other countries, we'll have, because in the UK, we're experiencing difficulties with storms and flooding already, both from rivers overflowing and storms, but also from the sea level. Gradually, that will get a lot worse. And what the uh, international experts are predicting is 
that we will see um, areas becoming uninhabitable, huge migrations, probably, probably civil wars. These are the extreme situations that, uh, that they're forecasting. Uh, so it's a very grave situation and one that, uh, in my view, um, merits strong reaction. You know. And um, how accurate has the uh, sort of climate predictions been up till now? Because, you know, some people are saying that uh, they were predicting uh, like catastrophes to have to have happened already, but a lot of them uh, haven't happened as of yet, as of now, at least. I think the the uh, the forecasts have been pretty accurate. There was a period of two or three years. That, I mean, there are other things that affect the temperature of the Earth. So, so the the rise isn't completely smooth. And there were two or three years. I think it was. I'm trying to remember. Sort of. 15, 16, and 17, perhaps, when uh, temperatures seem to be, for a short period, rather stable. But then they run, then they shot up again in accordance with the uh, with the predictions. So, yeah, the predictions have so far been fairly accurate, and the and there have been consequences. I mean, we've um, you know we have had terrible droughts in Africa. We have had uh, exceptionally uh, energetic tornadoes in the United States. And even in the UK, we have exceptional and increasing uh, flooding, which has caused quite serious, quite serious. But it's a progressive uh, thing, and the really big impacts are predicted for something like 50 years from now. So um, it's not a surprise that they haven't happened yet, but they are on the way, and I think there's every reason to believe that. Yeah. Um, so you said this was a situation that, in you, your view, where it's a strong, uh, strong reaction. I guess that brings us quite nicely on to energy policy. Yeah. What is energy policy, in your view, and what would that strong reaction look like? Well, energy policy is the whole range of measures that governments need to take, firstly to ensure affordable uh, energy and reliable energy sources for their public. So in the UK, for instance, at the moment, we undoubtedly need reliable sources of petrol, uh, reliable sources of gas, petrol for people to move around, reliable sources of gas for people to heat their homes and for industry and reliable electricity because everything runs on electricity you know, whatever you're talking about uh, shops hospitals industry uh, you know you can't even without electricity you won't have any light and you can't even pay for anything in a shop without electricity now and we couldn't communicate like this so reliable sources is a government obligation to provide reliable sources of energy in all these forms and to make it affordable, which is another big challenge. So in a way, those are the two traditional objects of energy policy, reliable energy and affordable energy. And now we have the third big policy of addressing climate change and reducing the carbon emissions because all the traditional energy is gas, oil, coal. The energy is produced by burning them. That unavoidably produces carbon dioxide. That's the chemical chemical reaction. So um, that is now a huge uh, dimension of energy policy. And of course, it's extreme. Well, all energy policy is very international because we have such international energy markets, especially the oil market. But now, uh, Climate change is very much an international uh, objective of energy policy. We have the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, a big international treaty. Uh, governments are struggling to make that work. The UK, to some extent, is in the forefront. We've said we're going to reduce our emissions to zero by 2050, which does make us amongst the world leaders in all of this. Um, so I guess those are the big areas of national and international energy policy. 
Um, so this leads me to uh, my next question, which is, um, so we're, we're in the 21st century now, and we've discovered nuclear energy about how many years ago was it? Quite, quite a while ago. We, we've had it for like one century. So. 70 years ago we had it. Yes, we had, I guess, the first nuclear reactor was in the 1950s. 1950s, okay. Yeah. So not quite... N- was it 70 years? <laughs> yeah. And we've and we have solar solar panels, we have wind turbines, but we're still so dependent on fossil fuels. Yes. And and this is one of the things that I learned from so we'll get to your book uh, we'll we'll get to your book in a bit, but one of the things I learned about was that most optimistic case by 2040, we will still be 61% reliant on fossil fuels. So what, that sounds like the International Energy Agency's yes. uh, sustainable case. You see, we are, I think we're about 80% dependent today. That's an extraordinary, I mean, that is an extraordinary and very disappointing thing that I think it's 25 years now since the, the treaty, the, 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 uh, the UNFCC, C, how many C's there are, yes, since the, since the climate treaty, in which governments committed to containing the uh, rise in global temperatures to safe levels. But since then, the share of fossil fuel in world energy hasn't really changed. It's still about 80%. It's shocking, really. Um, and, very, uh, and very depressing. But hopefully, we can indeed change that. Um, I mean, maybe now the IEA would offer you, you know, is more optimistic than the 40% in 2040. Uh, but it's going to take a big change. Yeah. Right. So, and what, what's the feature of fossil fuels that makes us so reliant on them, uh, as opposed to the other forms of uh, energy we've discovered in the in the nineteenth century. Well, I suppose they are late comers. Perhaps mm. um, they also have been cheap. That's you see, we um, nuclear energy became important in the nineteen sixties and seventies, and at that time, it's very interesting. If you know energy policy, then it was assumed that nuclear energy was going to basically be the energy of the future and it would just grow and grow. Um, but what happened was, well, first of all, there was a very grave accident at Chernobyl in the 1980s, I think, uh, and there were other scares. But also, particularly in America, they found cheap ways of producing gas. Gas became very cheap the efficiency of gas power stations increased enormously. And so nuclear didn't grow nearly as, nuclear is very important still. Nuclear is about, um, well, in the UK, it's 20% of electricity. It's an important uh, But it didn't grow in the way that people imagined because it was, too, it was much more expensive than gas, basically. And also, to say, in some countries, people were really worried about, about the danger. Now, renewables, they're fairly recent on the... When I say they're fairly recent, as a really competitive energy, they're fairly recent. Because the story of renewables is that, the, the, that if you go back to the 80s or early this century, they were thought of as very expensive. Um, but amazing, the costs have come down amazing, especially of wind, including offshore wind now, and solar power. But they've only been really competitive, I would say, for the last four or five, four or five years. And there's enormous inertia in the system. There's a, obviously, there's enormous investment in coal power stations, gas power stations, petrol cars, all the rest of it. Takes time to change. Takes time to change that. So, given this predominance of fossil fuels, what policies are being applied, or do you think should be applied, to try and shift us towards a 
more of a renewable base grid or what technologies need to be created? <laughs> How do we get to this um, low carbon grid? That is a very, very difficult question. I'll talk about the UK perhaps first. But I have to say the situation varies in different parts of the world because some countries have masses, you know, Norway, masses of cheap hydroelectricity. They have practically no carbon emissions from electricity generation today. Uh, so Brazil is a bit, is a bit similar. Other child companies have very cheap gas. Other countries have very cheap coal. Yeah, we used to have coal in the UK, but actually it became uncompetitive and we don't really mine significant amounts of... So it's different. But if we talk about the UK, what are the policies? Well, first of all, we've got to have a lot of affordable low-carbon electricity. That's really the foundation of getting the emissions down. And to do that, we've got to invest in wind, to some extent in solar, and in the technologies that make, that enable us to cope with the fact that they are intermittent. The wind doesn't blow, sometimes the wind doesn't blow, sometimes the sun doesn't shine. In fact, it never shines at night, which is when our peak electricity demand is. So you've got to make the grid more sophisticated, you've got to have some storage, perhaps some international links, flexible, you know, try and make demand a bit more flexible to when the supply is available. So, you know, you, you don't run your, you know, you run your washing machine perhaps in the night when there's plenty of nuclear power and nobody has any, has any use for that kind of thing. So a lot, and perhaps nuclear energy. I, this is debatable, but depending on how successful we are in finding ways of managing the intermittency of renewables, we probably will need an element of nuclear, of nuclear power in there. So, hopefully the result of all that will be a lot of reasonably affordable, low carbon electric power. Now when we've got that, we can convert our cars to electric. So we have electric cars instead of petrol cars. The government says, they're already saying no new uh, petrol cars beyond 2035. I think then we've got to deal with industry. So some industry can switch to electric power. Other industry, it's more difficult. You may need to have hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen to power industry that needs very, very high temperatures, or small nuclear reactors. That's not. So these are all things the government needs to promote. And then, perhaps most difficult of all, our own homes. You are sitting, I expect, in a gas, in a building with gas central heating. I certainly am. Practically everyone is. At the moment, there isn't any very attractive, straightforward alternative to that. So either we're going to have to convert our homes to electric heating of some kind, with things called heat pumps that make more efficient, or we're going to have to convert them. Instead of having gas, we have hydrogen. When you burn hydrogen, it doesn't produce CO2. It just produces water, so, or water vapor, steam. So we need, eventually, to convert our homes to, uh, uh, to alternative methods of heating probably first make them much more efficient so, uh, so that we can do these things cost effectively. So there we are, those are some of the areas. Obviously it's a very big, very, very big topic. Yeah. And you mentioned industry, so like a lot of, we're not a massive manufacturing economy here in the UK, though we do have some. Um, how do we tackle the emissions that are due to buying products in from abroad, the sort of offshore emissions from, like my computers come from China, um, a lot of tech from yes. Japan. It's a good how question. Does, like on an international scale, how does this work? It's a good question because in terms of emissions that are actually emitted in the UK, we've got quite a good story. I think we've reduced emissions by 40% since, is it 2000? Anyway, in the last decades, we've done very well, we've reduced our emissions, but as people point out, 
On the other hand, the emissions that are sort of inherent in the goods that we import have gone up. Not, not as much, but still a reduction. Still a reduction. Um, well, I think the, the probably the best way to try to deal with this is through the International Carbon Treaty. Getting under the International Carbon Treaty, individual countries are setting themselves targets for carbon reduction. There's no central sort of control of that. Um, but, you know, all countries around the world are making some efforts. Now, some are ahead of others. So, you know, if you're buying products today from China or India, they will be more heavily uh, carbon than in your telephone. They will be more uh, carbon intensive than products created in the UK. And I think we have to work to change that through international carbon negotiations and also through our own direct contributions because the developed world is committed to contributing a hundred billion dollars per annum to the developing countries to help them to achieve their low carbon transition so we can directly contribute both ourselves and through the various international financial bodies the imf the the, well, the international banks, the EBRD, the IMF, which all have programs to trying to promote low carbon transition uh, in those countries. And also, I think we can continue. London is an enormous finance center internationally. And to some extent, our financial institutions can promote the finance of investments that will reduce the carbon intensity of industry in other parts of the world. But there are some who argue that we should go further and we should put a tax on the carbon content of goods we import. Carbon import levy, or the various words for it. Um, for, for two reasons. The idea that, first of all, that will protect our industry. So if you're putting an extra charge on the imported goods, you know, their industry will say, well, then it's where we can compete more fairly if they have to pay for the carbon content. We're having to pay for our carbon content. Uh, and the other reason is, of course, to encourage the other countries in other parts of the world to reduce their carbon emissions. I'm a bit cautious about that because it's a very aggressive thing to do in international trade relations. The way that China and India and other developing countries are lifting themselves out of poverty is by selling manufactured goods initially to the West. China maybe is sort of getting beyond that phase. And so to say, oh no, we're going to impose our carbon rules on you and put a tax on your imports, very aggressive thing to do. And it might not even help in carbon terms because how are you going to win their cooperation in the carbon negotiations if you're sort of attacking them in this, in this way? So there's a lot of debate about that. You can see the logic, but it's also very disruptive to our relations with those uh, with those countries. Mm. So you, you might be able to use it as a leverage, like you could. So if they don't if they don't adjust to the to the like international rules and regulations, then you could you could you have you always have that card to put on them if if they're not abiding by the rules. That's true. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. There's a certain amount of leverage. You say, well, you know, we might have no choice but to impose some kind of a... Uh, yeah. That would be better than rushing. Certainly, there ought to be a lot of... If you're going to have these taxes, there needs to be a lot of diplomacy around them before you just start them on, I think. Yeah. yeah. That, um, I think, something I really wanted to ask, which is energy policies on always popular with um, a variety of groups, so like thinking of Macron in France trying to, uh, try to implement a fuel tax, which was one of the triggers for the Gilets Jean movement, and then um, in Washington State in the US, there was a, a lot of the oil companies spent a lot of money lobbying against the carbon tax there, I think. How, how do these policies get implemented? How do they get um, enforced. Yeah, that's a very good, very good uh, 
Because in a way, you've got, there are sort of almost two opposing political forces here. You've got people saying, look, we've got to address carbon. The, 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 there used to be a principle, the polluter should pay. So surely we should have a tax on carbon emissions reflecting the cost that you know the external costs as they're called that they impose on the economy both nationally and internationally and also because economists will say that that's the most efficient way of reducing emissions because you just have a tax on carbon the economy and all its uh, different uh, aspects will find the cheapest way of reducing reducing the emissions so there are strong arguments there but the problem is that um, energy is a disproportionately large share of the budgets of poor people. So it is what you call, um, uh, well, it's very negative from the point of view of welfare. It's a regressive, that's the word I'm looking for, it's called a regressive in effect. Any tax on carbon is in effect a regressive tax. It bears most heavily on the poor, which helps to explain why you have such powerful reaction to, and it's true, it's certainly true of gas and electricity, which are in every our household's budget. It's not statistically true quite the same way as petrol, but it is true that there are a very large number of relatively poor people who commute by car every day to their work and also value very greatly the freedom that having a car uh, gives them. And they are very sensitive to the idea that uh, petrol prices are going to... Uh... So, it's well, my, my book, it's a conundrum. How are you going to, you know, have... have Because it's very interesting, the Prime Minister, I've noticed, talking about coming out of the... Uh, the pandemic, and he was saying we're going to have a more caring uh, society, and I think everyone will agree with that. And so, you've got to be very, very careful about what you, what sort of carbon taxes uh, you impose. Now, there are two sort of big ideas around this. Um, both of them, I think, originating in in America. One is called a carbon dividend. It says you have a carbon tax but you uh, pay the money back. The original idea was you pay it back to every household an equal amount, and the effect of that would be that almost all households would be better off. But of course, you could also target it on, on less well-off. Uh, well so carbon dividend, you pay it back, and then the total impact isn't regressive anymore. And the other big idea, again coming from, is the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal, is it has many different forms, but the essence of it is, yes, you have, a, you have aggressive carbon policies, including carbon taxes, but you combine that with a wholesale reform of the social welfare system that will overall benefit the, benefit, uh, benefit the worse off. So those are, those are the ideas uh, that are around. My own view is... I started as an advocate of the carbon tax. The logic seemed to me quite strong, carbon tax with carbon dividend. But actually, I think it's more complicated than that. You've got to look at it sector by sector. So yes, probably I've gone on too long now, but anyway. <laughs> oh no, please, please go ahead. It's, it's getting interesting. Oh. When you see, in, in the abstract, you say, oh, carbon tax is a great thing. But then you've got to look at what's actually happening in the UK. Now, when it comes to motoring, which, but transport is now, after the reduction of emissions from energy, from uh, uh, electric, ge electric generation, transport is now the biggest single source of emissions in the UK. Not overwhelmingly so, but it is, the, it, is, it is the biggest. And actually, we already have a carbon tax on transport. We have a huge tax on petrol. Um, more than half of what you pay at the pet transport package is tax. 
huge tax on it. Much higher in terms of the cost per ton, ton of CO2 emissions than most of the sort of taxes that people would be would be thinking. Now, admittedly, it wasn't it wasn't put there because of climate change. It was put there, I think, partly to pay for the roads, or that much more than pays for the roads, and partly as a sort of congestion. Congestion just, and probably also partly because it was just a con the treasury spotted it as a convenient way of, of raising money. So it wasn't originally a carbon tax. But it doesn't alter the fact that it is a differential cost that electric cars do not pay. It's creating a very big and positive differential. So in that area, we've already got a carbon tax, a very big one. And the problem will be when, hopefully, electric cars take over, how is the Treasury going to recoup that enormous, so I think it's about 35 billion a year. It's enormous, enormous source of Treasury. So when electric cars come, the problem will be how you're going to recoup the revenue. But at the moment, it's a very big incentive. Then if you look at other areas, domestic gas, very socially sensitive, it's subsidized, not only not taxed, the rate of VAT on domestic gas is 5%, and pretty much everything else is 20%. So there we're already subsidizing it, but it's obviously very difficult socially to increase it. So, and electricity is similar. Um, I think we do need to find a strategy where we can raise the tax on certainly domestic gas, but it will have to be connected with a social program that substantially in other ways gives the money back to the uh, to uh, less well off less well off households there there i think we do need to have a uh, perhaps not urgently though because we haven't the thing about taxes in particular areas is they're most effective where you've got an alternative alternative that you can switch to Taxes on coal power stations, for instance, were very effective because there was gas available. It was pretty competitive. Renewables were coming along already subsidized by the government. So it was, you know, you've got a big change. In the short term, tax on gas for domestic and wouldn't, I don't think, have an enormous effect on that because there isn't any very attractive short-term alternative. But when we have the alternative, Probably we should have we should have a tax and we should we should return it. And industry, the other big area, we do tax industry. We um, we have this uh, industry levy, which I think is quite clever. The industry is subject to a substantial levy, but individual sectors of industry are have been invited to come forward with their own programs for carbon reduction. And if those programs are sufficiently aggressive, the tax is largely, uh, largely given back, largely, uh, largely emitted. If you have a very big tax on industry, you run into the problem you've just been asking me about. How can you make sure that it still competes with other, um, other interests? So I think we do need carbon taxes, but you've got to be a bit selective and judicious about how you, um, how you impose them. I am a bit sorry. I know I'm going on a long time, but I do one other point I would make. Politically, I think it's quite difficult to to do this sort of tax, what I call tax engineering, where you say, "Well, we're putting this tax on a very sensitive area, but don't worry, because you'll get my money back in another way." I think convincing the public of that, public are very instinctively very skeptical of new taxes and take a lot of persuading that you know in the round it's a good thing yep mm -hmm. and uh, what's your um, uh, opinion on um, a green new deal what do you think about that could you explain to us what that is and what do you think of it I think it's a good idea. <laughs> uh, but I, when I say that, it's a, it's a very general idea. 
And I think it links with what the Prime Minister was saying about a more caring society. I was a bit disappointed by where when the Prime Minister sort of gave his, was it on Thursday? No, it was on Sunday, wasn't it? He gave his talk. And he ended it by saying, when we come out, we won't come out just the same. We'll be a more caring society. But he didn't also say we'll be a low carbon society, which would be desirable, but frankly, is not in the front of everyone's minds. You've got to, uh, um, you've got to accept that. But the idea of connecting lower carbon with a more caring society, I think, is fundamentally right. Um, and I think would involve, yes, some energy having a somewhat higher price, but a stronger social security system, more generous income supplements, more generous uh, unemployment benefits, strengthening the health service, all these things that uh, I think most people would like to do. Um, you know, how fast you can do it, how it depend, comes down to resources. Um, maybe this will, yeah, talk about coming out of, uh, yes, I would link this with what happens as we come out of, um, uh, come out of lockdown or whatever you want to call it. People hope that we won't exactly go back to where we were before. But of course, you have to accept there are an enormous number of people at risk of losing their jobs and their livelihood who desperately need us to, you know, industries and so on to get back into. Uh, um, so the government will have to spend a lot of money getting industry and various trades and businesses back on their feet. And I think it's generally accepted that we can borrow to do that and we should borrow to do that. And that is connected with the caring society, strengthening the health service after this experience and so on. And included in that, as we can, should be low carbon policies. And I think probably it will, you know, I hate to say this because it's painful, but included in that eventually will have to be somewhat more expensive energy, yes. And uh, what do you think of uh, people who say that regardless of how hard we, we enforce those regula regulations or how high we put, we put the carbon taxes, for example, uh, there is a still rest of the world that might not be abiding. So like, why should we punish ourselves disproportionately? I'm just well, a plain devil's advocate, by the way. Yes, no. Um, do you know, because I do a lot of international energy policy and so on, and I think in the UK, we... It's a, it's a, we are world leaders. Probably, there's a, in my experience, it's probably a controversial thing to say, there are a limited number of countries in the world that genuinely, as opposed to rhetorically, have regard to how they can, their policies and their influence can actually improve the world as a whole. Now, I'm not saying we're going to, you know, impoverish ourselves to doing, but we have to, we do take that into account. We have taken that into account. And I think that's a good thing. And we're doing it with climate change. And I think that's a good, good thing to do. We, we still are fairly influential in the world. I find from certainly from the international energy discussions that I'm involved in, a lot of people sort of take note of what the UK is doing. We're regarded as world well, leaders in some respects. We led a revolution of making energy more competitive, more market-based. The rest of the world, largely, well, large parts of the world followed us. And I think we can be influential in this. And I, I mean, it is a moral question you're asking, but I think we should play a positive role uh, in this, even 
Um, having said that, it's very important that what we do at home is combined with a big international diplomatic effort to try to influence the rest of the world. I think we are trying to do that. It's difficult, but we are trying to do that in a small way. I'm working on that with the, with the Chinese. Yeah. And earlier, we sort of discussed a bit about the um, Industrial Revolution and how our fossil fuels have taken this in terms of economic progress and improving people's standards of living. Um, how do you skip the fossil fuel stage in countries that don't have the same energy infrastructure as us at the moment? So places like um, maybe countries in Africa or Bangladesh where there might not be a national grid. How do we improve those people's standard of living but um, without jeopardizing our climate aims? At the same time, this is getting on to... No, it's, I think it's, it's a good question, and uh, I feel very strongly that we must not do anything in the interests of climate change that will jeopardize the prospects of the poorest people in the world. And... One of the most exciting things is that in the last couple of decades, there's been a huge fall in the proportion of the world that lives in extreme poverty. I think I'm right in saying that from 30% to, uh, no, I don't have the percentages to hand, but there's been, a, it's certainly more than halved, the number of people in the world who are living in extreme Poverty, and that has happened through the spread of industrialization, powered, one has to admit, by coal, just coal and oil. The, the, the most rapid change has happened in China and India, and it's been based on rapid increase in use of coal. So that's why sometimes when people say, oh, we must stop people building coal power, I say, oh, but I think we do need, we can legitimately uh, discourage people from building because now we've had this technology revolution, uh, particularly in Africa, where there's lots of sun, unlike the UK, uh, uh, solar power, and in many, many countries, wind power are now cheaper than coal. And what's more, you can. They don't have to be centralized in the way. An efficient coal power station has to be very big. But an efficient photovoltaic installation does not have to be very big. So, you know, you can go to villages and, uh, and install photovoltaic uh, um, generation and sometimes transform people's lives like that. Um, and... And that is what is happening in many in, in many parts of the world, and there are other, there's hydropower and other low carbon. So I'm with the idea that we should be encouraging these countries and using our our financial influence to uh, you know, stimulate or to encourage their transition. I'm still a little bit cautious to say you know oh you must actually prevent them from. Uh, you know, ever building a, it, I think it, it depends a bit on the circumstances. Um, so I think, or well, sort of gas, you say you can't build a gas, you can never build a gas power. Um, so I'm strongly in favor of helping them to make the transition, but I think you, I'm also a little bit cautious and being too absolute in that if there's a risk that it stands in the way of rapid. Uh, industrialization and rapid improvements in prosperity. Yeah. So is that where the conundrum sort of is? That how do you protect future of the earth and future generations on one hand and on the other hand, you don't want to, you do want to improve people's qualities of lives right now. Is, is, that, is that sort of where the conundrum lies? Well, 
Do you know there is less of a conundrum now mm. than there is when I wrote the book? Really? There is perhaps a bit of a conundrum, but in all honesty, now, because of the rapid decline in the costs of electricity, oh, sorry, of uh, renewables, in many situations, the low carbon option is also the economic option and the fastest way to raise living standards, not necessarily in all situations. So I think there's a very good trend there. And I think it's definitely wrong to present this as a, you know, an out and out, out and out conflict. Yes. And there's always some degree of, you know, if you're putting a constraint, uh, a low carbon, there's always some degree of economic economic cost, yes. I mean, you might say there's a conundrum in the UK, as I say, between uh, in the short term cheap energy and uh, low carbon. If we, work, if we want to go low carbon, we're going to have to spend a lot of money on wind, solar, the electric grid, energy storage, charging points for electric vehicles. Um, you know, there are costs. There are costs. Hopefully, they're tra mainly transitional costs. You know, you've got through it. You've made these investments. Cheap energy. In the future. Yeah. Um, and uh, you, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the, this question, then you can go. Um, so, I guess. So, is there is the reason there is less of a conundrum now? Is that because of the? Well, you wrote you wrote the book in two thousand eighteen. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, but yes, of course I was writing it, but yes, I published it in two. Oh, no. oh, fair enough. Yeah. So is the reason that uh, there is less of a conundrum now, is that due to the technological advancements in that period? Yes. Or is there... Cost is reductions. There... Right. Very rapid cost reductions. I mean, the cost reduction in solar power, not since 1918, but... So 2018, <laughs> but over the last 20 years, there have been 90 percent. Mm. Incredible. And wind costs are more than halved. So it's an extraordinary change that's taking place. And that is, e well, it's easing the conundrum. I don't say there isn't a conundrum, but it's easing the conundrum. Yes. And did you see that coming? Not entirely, no. Right. I would put my hand on my heart and say, you know, I did not predict how rapidly these costs would come down. And we need, we also, by the way, need the costs of storage to come down. Mm. And that, to some extent, you know, we're still seeing the costs are coming down, but um, not enough yet. So, for instance, to give you an example, supposing in the UK, we were largely dependent on wind and solar for our uh, electric power. And furthermore, electric power was powering our vehicles, most of our industry, and so on. What are you going to do? And you can, oh, I said there's no solar power at night, when there's peak demand. But actually, we have now storage that is reasonably economic, where you can, you know, you can regularly store energy generated at three o'clock in the afternoon and deliver it at six o'clock or seven o'clock at night when peak, peak demand is. So the relatively short-term storage that's used regularly, uh, that's coming into being economic. But what we don't have is storage which will cope with the situation. Well, supposing you had a whole month in February when there was relatively very little wind. Now, we never have or practically never have no wind across the United Kingdom. But we do have quite sustained periods, and sometimes very cold periods, when there's relatively little wind. And storing enough electricity where you could actually make up a really big chunk of demand over a period of a month or even a couple of weeks, that's still too expensive. And so we need technology improvements to become sort of basically wholly dependent on renewables. We need more technology improvement. So one of the reasons why, you know, you perhaps need to have a side bet on nuclear energy uh, at the moment. Now, I'm specialising in energy and sustainability engineering, and I know that my lecturers are always talking about research into energy storage at the moment. 
Uh, yes, yes, and we need it because it's been. But costs do seem to be coming down. They do seem to be. Uh, and of course, if we can do it, we could we could improve electric vehicles. We wouldn't have any range anxiety or whatever it's called. Uh, there are big areas that we need to uh, research, put money into researching. It is happening, of course, because now it's very commercially attractive. Batteries, um, uh, grid technologies, um, converting electricity into hydrogen. Because one of the options, hydrogen is sort of like electricity, so you can use a vector, it's a way you can store energy and you can move energy in the form of hydrogen. And it could be the solution to some of the most difficult problems, shipping, aviation, heavy industry. At the moment, hydrogen is mostly created by reforming natural gas, which is a process which emits carbon dioxide. So not very attractive unless you can sequester the carbon dioxide. But you can also make it by uh, from water with electric power. At the moment, that's rather an expensive process, but that's an area where technology may be developing. And you can, one of the visions people have is you say, well, we'll rely on wind. Sometimes it'll be too much, sometimes it'll be too little. When it's too much, it will generate hydrogen from uh, seawater or water, and uh, we'll store that hydrogen, and that will provide electricity when the wind isn't blowing. So that's a vision that many people have. Um, is that going to become cost-effective vision? Depends on the progress of that, reducing the cost of that technology. Very, very important to try to work on. And um, on the topic of technology, uh, to what extent has the uh, have the technological advancements been um, because of um, private sector? And to what what extent was it the public sector that helped make these advancements? It's both. Um, certainly, solar energy goes back to advances made by the American national government laboratories. A lot, the, I have to say the American national government laboratories are probably the world's biggest repository of government energy research and they have made and they're working on batteries, they've made huge progress on solar. I don't know whether they throw quite as much to wind, I'm not quite sure. But yes, you need both because well, now we've reached a stage where industry is spending a lot of money on research on batteries because they're already a huge commercial, you know, the car company that can produce a battery that's even 10% more efficient, you know, is, has a big... But at the early stage, when there isn't yet a big commercial uh, outlet or where very large amounts of money you know, need to be spent, to, you've got to rely on government, so governments have to contribute to... Uh, Governments have to go. We are we are increasing our uh, energy R and D, and we need to increase our energy R and D here in the UK. Changing, yeah, changing tack a bit. Uh, coronavirus is at the forefront of everyone's minds at the moment. How has it impacted? Oh, so, sorry, I didn't catch that. No. Uh, coronavirus is oh, at yes, yes, the yes. forefront of people's minds at the moment yes. um, for obvious reasons. But how has it impacted? of how we're using energy and we, we spoke a bit about having to have a green recovery. Yes. Um, well, the impact of it and where do we go from here? Well, at the moment, I don't know why I want to say this because obviously it's a, the coronavirus is a huge international tragedy. So it's not, you know, it's a very bad thing, but it has had the effect of greatly reducing emissions. The IEA are predicting that this year, global emissions will be 8% down on what they were last year, which is amazing when you can, you know, despite all the efforts around the world to get them under control, emissions have been steadily, gradually rising up until this point. So to have an 8% reduction, amazing. And in the UK, if we have lockdown, during lockdown, I think they will probably be 20 or more percent below the standard level because people aren't driving, a lot of industry is closed, you know, all those reasons. A lot of houses and shops aren't lit. Uh, 
so big. It's a very interesting question what the longer term implications are for climate. I mean, some people will say, actually, there's a powerful story here because here we are, we're addressing a global challenge and we've shown that we can adapt, that we can, uh, you know, we can rely on, take note of scientific advice and, um, and that's just what we need to do with climate change. And maybe those are the lessons there that people will learn. Say, yes, take the scientists seriously. Yes, we can adapt. Yes, we can, you know. And so that's the sort of optimistic story. On the other hand, you have to face the fact that I think climate change has been, as a topic, has been slightly pushed aside in the headlines. And this big climate summit was supposed to take place, you see, in Glasgow, in November, there was supposed to be, we were supposed to be hosting the World Climate Summit. It was the year when all governments were supposed to come forward with new and more aggressive uh, emissions targets. Now, some countries have, admittedly, but, you know, that's gone. It's, I don't know whether there's a clear, you know, it will happen again, it'll be, but I think, you know, there's definitely loss of momentum there, unfortunately. And as we come out, yes, we must try to, I was listening to Mark Carney on talking about this, saying, you know, we've got a great chance to reshape the economy in a cleaner way as we come out. Don't just sort of rebuild it exactly as it was. And I agree with that in principle. I think we must look for areas. There are some quite helpful areas. For instance, you know, look what we're doing now. More people are communicating electronically. Maybe if the uh, um, if we didn't have the, uh, the virus, I would have been on the train to Leeds, or driving worse, driving to Leeds, or flying to Leeds. You know. So, you know, we're using electronic communications more, and sometimes in place of going to meetings, even international international travel. People are working from home instead of commuting every day. So, you know, these are all areas the government is working now and put money in bicycles. There are quite a lot of areas you can point to which could have you know, longer term benefits from climate change. And as we come out, the government will be spending a lot of money to get industry you know, back on its feet. It's, in a way, I mean, why there won't be any, you know, the money will be, government, so it won't be spare money, but the government is going to have to spend huge amounts on this. And there may be areas, and of course, let's be honest, climate change will not be the priority. The priority, the priority will be getting people back to work on the economy on its feet. But within that, you can find areas where you can give more emphasis or you can work with industry on what their strategies are and uh, uh, and, ha and move towards a, clean, a cleaner and you know, lower carbon, lower carbon economy. Oh, is, is it my turn? <laughs> How long we we going for quite a long time? Yeah, no, we're, we're, no, it's just we have we have we have, we have separate questions. We, we <laughs> miss track of whose turn it was. All right, no, quite how I like that. I have it going. It's okay. Um, so is it possible to have a green start restart the economy with more with green energy? As a put, since like a lot of the factories have been shut shut down, start to having. Um, with 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 government subs like, is it possible to have government subsidize uh, green energy for a, for an economic recovery post uh, post pandemic? Or am I just yes? The answer is yes. Right. Okay. But I, there's this, I've got to be sort of say what I said before. We have to face that the priority will be getting people back into work, getting the economy going. And that will mean restarting, you know, I, mean, you can't, I won't be able to, you know, you've got an extreme position of saying, well, all right, you close your factory that's producing cars, thousands of people are out of work, 
but sorry, you can only restart producing electric cars, and that's going to take you five years, or well, not five years, but you know, a couple of years to gear up. I mean, do you see what I mean? This, it's a matter of degree. But you could say, I think it would be reasonable to say to a car company, all right, we're going to give you a lot of help. We're paying most of the wages of, of your people. What is your plan to, uh, um, to convert to, to low carbon? You know, to engage in a sensible way as to how you can achieve, you know, both the object, both, both the object. I mean, frankly, if I was a car worker and out of work and worried about my future and my family's future, and the government said to me, oh, what your factory has been producing, you know, I wouldn't be very... <laughs> so, you see what I mean? You've got to... But yes, that should be the objective. And I think finding areas to invest in that are green, that create employment, a lot of employment. And there are, and for instance, the efficient, energy efficiency of buildings, that's quite labor intensive. I think if the government had a big program on that, that would employ a lot of people. Installing solar panels on homes, that's quite labor intensive. That's an area that could, uh, um, I could certainly, and all, but also, you know, to some extent in wind, solar, all these areas. Um, so, as I say, with the caveat that getting people back to work must, has to be the priority. Yes, we should be trying to build a greener technology as we come back. And I think there is, poten there is serious major potential for that. Well, I guess places like France are already doing that in some way. It's, they've got some deal with an airline that they failed out, or I think I read about, um, to reduce the emissions from the airline. That sounds great. That's that just the sort of thing that you should, because they, you know, we're going to have to support the airlines. It means helping an industry that's a big emitter. Um, but you know, one of the things I, uh, besides the book that we've been talking about, the energy conundrum, I'm going to reference into that. Besides my book, I just recently uh, issued a discussion paper, a Grantham discussion paper. It's on the Grantham Grantham Imperial College web website about how people can adapt, how people are willing to adapt. I think that we need, there are some very difficult issues that we need to discuss. It's quite difficult to see how we're going to significantly reduce emissions from aviation, for instance, without making flying quite a lot more expensive and therefore having the effect that a lot of families who nowadays are able to fly for their summer holiday to wherever, the Bahamas or probably south of Spain or somewhere, won't be able to afford it. Are people, you know, is, is that something people will be willing to do for the, you, know, you can't do that sort of thing without debate. I think the same applies to gas prices and, you know, how you, uh, you need... It's coming down to us, actually. You, you know, so far we've mainly reduced carbon emissions in the UK by switching power generation from coal to renew gas and renewables. Doesn't affect ordinary people at all. Electricity is just the same. It's reliable. You don't notice the difference. When you talk about changing the way we travel, changing the way we heat our homes, changing the technology for flight, direct impact. And I don't think governments can just sort of hand down the tablets of stone, as it were, and say, this is, this is the answer. I think you've got to, there's got to be a discussion about this. You know, are people, are we willing to, and are, and are you know, people who are not necessarily very wealthy have to be involved in this. Because I will still be able to fly to, probably to the Bahamas or something, but a lot of people won't, for whom that's important. I will probably still have a car and be able to drive around. But for a lot of people, people driving second-hand, cheap second-hand cars, need them to go to work every day, really value the chance of taking their family out for trips and so on, or visiting parents and this sort of thing. How are you going to make the you know can you how do you make the transition to electric vehicles without um, uh, you know without impact? 
So these are the difficult questions that, you know, you've got to get into the public domain and people to, to discuss and consider how, you know, what are the options that are going to, going to be acceptable? And that can be, otherwise, you will have more, uh, you know, uh, yellow vests and go, I mean, we've, we've had yellow vests in the UK when uh, we had a rule up to about, I think, was it 1970, 1980, where there was a continuous increase in petrol taxes. And there was a rebellion led by lorry drivers. They embargoed the uh, petrol depots and the country very nearly came to a complete halt. Terrible. So we had our popular protest against petrol. Um, so, I mean, I, in a way, it's, I don't know if it's a weak thing to say, but yeah, we need, to, we need to bring this out into the open. And sometimes I feel some of the, the uh, um, you know, the NGOs are saying, oh, you know, it's the wicked oil companies. Stop them from, well, you know, all right, maybe it's the wicked oil companies. But actually, it's us driving around in cars. You know, are we willing to switch? Are we willing to uh, make the effort to drive less or to fly less or to switch to electric cars? Which, you know, so, you know, yeah. This is the meat of it. This is the meat of it. Yeah. Um, kind of brings me on to something I was saying a bit. Um, <laughs> and so I'm on the subject of people and uh, rebellion even. I'm very involved in Extinction Rebellion. And I was wondering what you thought the role of sort of protest and um, environmental activism is in Bringing about this, uh, bringing about a change to a green world alongside energy yeah. policy and uh, stuff like that. And well, I think, yeah, I, think it's, I think it's great. I think the Extinction Rebellion was very effective. It raised the profile. I don't necessarily agree with every, you know, sometimes I think some of the things they say are a bit unrealistic, but it was very effective in raising the profile, which I think was the objective. And I don't think, by the by the way, that if it wasn't if it wasn't for Extinction Rebellion, I'm not sure that the UK would have its target of reducing emissions to zero by 2050. It's very difficult to sort of follow these things. So I think it had impact. I think it was excellent from that point of view. The only thing I would say was, and you can perhaps correct me on this, as far as I know, the members of Extinction Rebellion didn't say anything at all about what they were going to do to reduce carbon emissions. I don't think anyone said, you know, we agree we won't do any flying, or we agree we will turn down our thermostat, we won't have our thermostat more than 18 degrees, or... Uh, but then, I'm not, by the way, I'm not speaking as one who's made great sacrifices on self this. But it seems to me, in some ways, it would have, you know, well, it would certainly have added if there was some sense that the, that the members were doing something themselves and not just banging up. Because in the last resort, that's why I talk about debate, the government can only do things that the public agree to. We have government by consent. So the government can't just, you might say, oh, put up the price of gas, put up uh, uh, the uh, value added tax on gas. Great thing to do. Government basically can't do that because they'll be voted out. Uh, and so, you know, it's got to come from the grassroots as well. And so I would have been even more positive about uh, Extinction Rebellion if they said, and we, every, because it's an institution, so you can be a member of the, as I understand it, you are, you are probably a, a member. If they said, to be a member, you've got to say something. I'm not sure how it crafted. It probably couldn't, shouldn't be too harsh because you something about what you're willing to do yourself. Oh, that's my that's yeah. my take on extinction rebellion. But we need it. We we need it because that's what made the profile and that's what um, delivers change. Yeah. So it's um, great to hear that you think it had a sort of direct impact. Oh, without without doubt. Um, on the 
Well, I mean, they did some crazy things, and I mean, I'm not in favour of planning on top of that, but I mean, most members of, of Extinction Rebellion aren't in favour of that either, I think. Yes, there was uh, big some men against the crazy the, but that, that's, yeah. And that, that kind of links to what I want to say, just come back with your point, which was about uh, having to make a personal sacrifice um, to protect the climate to be in, in XR. Uh, the, the kind of idea was to bring in as many people as possible um, and as long as you agree to the sort of key aims which are on the website if people are interested you can call yourself a member there isn't something uh, you have to do to be a member yeah. um, though in my experience a lot of the people who are um, do make personal sacrifices so. oh I'm sure they do I'm not being cynical yeah. about you know that I'm sure if you look at, you know, if you do a survey of who is doing green things, you would find that members of Extinction Rebellion are doing a lot more than most, most other people. But it wasn't part of the really the message. The message was that the government must do everything. Yeah, the message is a bit very much uh, that the system has to change to make the... And it's right to be on the government, by the way. Government is very, very powerful. Government is drives energy, more and more energy... energy policy is controlled by government, it's right to beat on government. Um, but I just think increasingly, because the things we need to do will affect lifestyle, we need to raise the debate on, you know, what is going, what is acceptable, what is, you know. Okay. Um, so I have a few questions as well with regards to sort of uh, activism. Um, so to to what extent are the problems we're having um so to what extent can they be solved by individuals changing their lifestyles because so for example right so for example like in the uk we have a we have a benefit system right so if you're poor if your earning goes yeah. less than a certain threshold government pays you if that system, in the absence of that system, you know, you could still have people paying charities, and ch but it wouldn't work anywhere near as good as it's working now because it was a centralized government program. So, I guess, would it, so wouldn't it make sense for Extinction Rebellion people to want a governmental change as opposed to as opposed to trying to convince individuals to change their lifestyles? Well, I'm going to really repeat what I said. I mean, I think um, you know, Extinction Rebellion has put, had a very useful and effective role in influencing governments, and, and governments are very, very important in all of this. But as I say, I, I think it would have increased its influence and its credibility if there was some kind of a message about what uh, the members of themselves were doing. I mean, you could be fairly careful, careful about how you... Uh, maybe it would be just rather general in nature, but um, you need both. I mean, you need leaders who... Uh, um, you know, who, who influence other people. You know, we know somebody, we know people who are buying electric cars, we're going to ride in them. That will probably influence us. We are quite interested in the idea of having an electric car. Um, so, the, to an individual people starting to take an initiative is very, very important for the way. Now, you know, I'm not really an expert. I'm not a sociologist. You, I mean, there's a whole sort of science around this, but I don't think there's any doubt that people with conviction, you know, starting to give a lead is one of the ways that society uh, changes changes itself. You know? um, and something else I want to ask you would uh, is so. So where we are now with regards to climate change, and, and it's on a global scale, it's not just UK, um, to, to what extent is our climate change problem 
um, is because of lack of political will as opposed to the absence of technological uh, innovation. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so. Well, it's, I mean, it's both. I'm, uh, there is political will. It's not strong enough. We, and to get all the way, we could be a lot further advanced if we had had stronger political will. But to get all the way, to really address the problem, we need both. We need political will and technological and technological change. I suppose that's, that's what I would say. But political will is... Um, uh, and I think we have had... I'm a... I worked for the government for years, and so I'm probably a bit more sympathetic than some. But you know, politicians act within a framework. They, you know, they've got to get re-elected. That's not, you know, that's and even if even if it's a government that isn't a democracy, ultimately nowadays all governments depend on popular popular consent. So they, it's really leadership that you need from governments, and I think they are trying to exert exercise uh, leadership um, but we need a lot more yes mm. do, do you have any more questions Nathan I think so Go ahead. Hello. <laughs> I, I know you're quite involved in geopolitics as well you know you know quite a bit about geopolitics um, could, could you tell us about the how how the fight over oil has formed out geopolitics globally. Oh goodness! <laughs> yeah, just, oh, I will, but I think we're probably coming. Now. If we get, we're getting rather wide, so maybe this will be. The, is this the last question? Uh, we, yes, yes, pretty much. That I will talk about. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, well, the thing about oil is that every country has come to be very heavily dependent on regular supplies of oil and at least in the past the oil, the oil in the ground is uh sort of happens to be distributed uh very much concentrated in some parts of the world and not actually historically the parts of the world that most needed the oil unlike coal coal is seems to have been pretty well distributed to most of the countries that need it. And, but oil, at least in terms of oil that has been found, the huge reservoirs are in the Middle East, uh, and it's desperately needed. It has been needed in Europe, in America, and now in Asia. And, um, and also it's easy to transport. Because it's liquid, it's pretty con highly concentrated energy, and you can just put it in a huge chip or put it in a pipe. So that has created this situation of tremendous dependency uh, of the West on oil supplies, and it's driven a lot of, you know, going back. Uh, um, because the West, most of the Middle East was run by colonial powers up until the 60s, or I don't know where exactly to place that. And, very cheap, and, and they extracted very cheap oil. Um, and then there was a period when the oil, oil was still pretty cheap, but the countries were becoming to be their own, be their own masters. And then we had this huge crisis in the 1970s of the war between Israel and most of the Arab, most of the Arab states, and America, and to some extent Europe, was on the side of Israel. And suddenly, the Arab oil-producing countries, particularly Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait, um, realized their power, and they threatened an embargo. There was a huge crisis. The price of oil rocketed. Everyone was in a panic. It's one of the reasons, by the way, why nuclear power was being given such a, such a, such a huge pressure. And 
that led to the creation of the International Energy Agency, which was a club of Western countries uh, trying to protect themselves from, you know, they built up stocks and had you know, shared supplies and all that stuff. Uh, and tensions around the Middle East have been uh, very high ever since. Now it's a huge play with Russia. Russia is the biggest, uh, um, the world's biggest producers are Russia, Saudi Arabia, and America. Tremendous tensions between them over, over the supply of oil. Um, and yeah, it's driven, driven a lot of politics. I think we might be able to... summary, such a huge subject. Yeah, yeah, I think we might be able to do a whole episode on it. <laughs> <laughs> we could do a whole episode on it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, again, pretty much last question. Uh, so, do, 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 so, if you could change one thing about the world, what would it be? In the energy field, because I, mean, I think. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, in the energy field. Let's confine it to the energy field because there are other things that. Uh, oh, my gosh. What would it be? Hmm. Maybe a thing you would change, not the. A thing. Probably the single thing is I would put a lot more money into research of low carbon options, particularly batteries, um, smart grids, uh, energy storage. There we are. There we go. And uh, any any f final words to end the to end the interview on? Any final notes? Any 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 projects you're currently doing? Any books? Any? Obviously, we'll put all. Well, your read my book. I have published a book on all this. The, yes. The energy conundrum. I hope people will uh, look it's at that. A, links in my discussion the, paper. You get the energy conundrum off Amazon. It's uh, a very good book. Definitely recommend it. Oh, well, that's very kind. And more recently, uh, specifically on the UK adaptation. Uh, read my discussion, uh, uh, my discussion paper on basically, but it's called the, it's called paying for net zero. How are we going to find ways to fund uh, the transition to net and zero? Where can I, people find that? On the Grantham Institute's uh, um, web website, Grantham Institute Imperial College, Grantham. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would, what I would finish with is. You can be very negative about, you know, we've been working on climate change for 25 years, emissions have still continued to increase. But I think there are grounds to be optimistic. The biggest reason to be optimistic is because the technology is advancing so fast. Wind, solar, storage, critical, perhaps electrolysis, electrolysis and hydrogen. Um, so the technology is advancing. We do have a global framework in place in the climate treaty that um, I think has the potential to greatly increase its, uh, its effectiveness. We may not meet the targets that people are setting one and a half degrees, two degrees. I think those, those are very, very tough targets. We are going to suffer significant harm from climate change but I have a degree of optimism that the world, with political commitment, with the technologies that are developing, that the world will change course and that we will avoid the worst effects of climate change. Okay. And on that positive note, we, we, we've, had, we've had Neil Hurst, everyone. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Okay. Pleasure. Okay. So it was it was my first episode with my friend to my left, my friend uh, Nathan Strafty. Uh, so would you like would you like to introduce yourself, Nathan? To yeah, our audience. Sure. I'm a friend of Mohammed's. Known him since we were both spotty teenagers at school. Um, would I, you like to tell us about your environmental work <laughs> as opposed I, to exposing my child? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's what we meant. Uh, I'm 
an engineering student, very interested in environment and sustainability. So at the moment, I'm doing a general engineering degree, but I'll be specialising in sustainable buildings and stuff like that. And as I mentioned in the main interview, very involved in Extinction Rebellion, where these lovely, colourful posters are from. And I do a lot of uh, media and messaging work with them. So talking to newspapers and trying to get them to say nice things about us and promote the, well, more seriously, tell the truth about how serious the climate crisis is. And um, yeah, do a lot of environmental stuff. True rebellion. So tell us this. What did you think of what did you think of today's interview, Nathan? Very interesting. Um covered masses of uh, different things. Sort of interesting to hear about energy policy where we are at the moment and where we've been. Um very interesting what you said about uh, how you implement a Green New Deal or carbon tax, whichever one you get to go for. Um and then was uh, all stuff about how coronavirus has affected it. There's a big push at the moment to sort of build back better and have green stimulus packages to rejuvenate the economy. Um, so, interesting to see that solar panels, green buildings could be a part of that. Um, and then, I was very pleased about we said with rebellion having influenced the uh, influenced the UK's commitment to net zero by 2050, which is in exile's view way too late, but is still um positive thing to be working towards. Um, and uh, interesting to hear what what the climate policy establishment think of these protest movements. Uh, yeah, what, what did you think? Um, yeah, I, I mean, um, so I didn't, I didn't think he would be so optimistic. So the, the, the optimism w was surprising, which is good. So he, he, he was telling us, oh, since, well, he wrote the, he, the book, his book was published in 2018. Uh, but, you know, before that, was, he said that since then, the predictions have been improved have been more optimistic due to the due to the technological advancements we, we've had so that's a positive note and yeah. um it, it was overall so it was so usually in the news right uh, you 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 mostly every, anything you get is like negative they because you know that's the nature of news right if if something good happens, it's usually the negatives they they have to emphasize. So it's good to to see to see we're making progress, I guess. Um, yeah, I think that important important not to downplay the terrible situation that we're in with the climate crisis. We had fires in Australia this year, which were worsened by um, elevated temperatures. Uh, the last time we had a year that was below average temperatures as a nation was before either of us were born. Um, and there's massive uh, like, uh, biodiversity loss. But yeah, I think it's important to recognize how bad the current situation is, but also tell the story of um, the story of hope, which I thought he did quite well. With, um, it's bad at the moment, but this is where we can go and this is what we could do. Yeah, yeah, and also it was interesting to to me about the the part where where I asked him about uh, whether he thinks it's because of lack of political will or because of innovation, and he said both essentially. So which, which is which is very so which is very interesting because so it's not the our climate crisis. It's not because if we had the you know we had the people with the right. So if if our politicians were being more effective, we would we wouldn't be in this crisis. We would have still had this a large portion. Well, some at least 
to some extent, the portion is that we just we need new technology. We need new advancements to be made in the future. Yeah, it's um, it's no silver bullet, is there? We need yeah, political will. We need new technologies. We need um, the public on board. Well, yeah, one, yeah. So, so it's takes. yeah. We've made a triangle now. So a triangle of <laughs> tell us the triangle again. Technology, uh, public will. I'm government, like, yeah. pol political will, technology, people. There we go. And of course, oh. you have interests of different people in different. So, you know, you have to take that in mind. This starting to sound like an engineering lecture now. We'll have stakeholder influence maps <laughs> out <laughs> very soon. <laughs> uh, okay, so if if you guys enjoyed today's episode, make sure to like. Share, subscribe, everything. And uh, would you like to promote yourself, Nate? Where can people find you? Do you have a Twitter? Well, I'm on Twitter. Uh, What's your Instagram. handle? Well, I'll put it on the screen. Pew, there we yeah, go. Yeah, you can do that. Complicated surnames. <laughs> um, where, where else? How can people get involved in into political activism? In oh, if they want to be involved in environmental activism, then I'd encourage them to like um, Extinction Rebellion's pages on Facebook. I'm involved in Extinction Rebellion Sheffield, which is where I study. Um, so you can drop me a message through the uh, details Mohammed will put on the screen and Google Extinction Rebellion, sign up on their website. Um, You'll get start getting emails from your local group, and great way to get involved. Perfect. Okay, so we end our podcast with showing that heart symbol. Do you know how to make a heart symbol with your hands? Yeah. Okay, guys, there we go. Bye bye. <laughs> All right. <laughs>